Welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks, all of you, for coming back after lunch. Uh, we have a very interesting afternoon session. And uh, my name is, uh, well, Marcia Krauses, and I work, I'm a director of data science at the microphone. OK. I'll use this one then. OK. OK. Hello. Hi, everybody. Welcome back in uh, this afternoon session. Uh, we have a very interesting program, so we're going to get started now. Um, I was introducing myself. I'm the, uh, Marcel Krauses, the Director of Data Science at the Institute for Quantitative Social Science, and work with Salil Vadan, collaborating on the Data Privacy Tools uh, project. So our first speaker is Betsy Maciello, uh, Senior Manager of Global Public Policy at Google. Uh, Betsy has a wide background that includes uh, computer science, economics, technology, um, policy, and she has even been a Bergman Fellow for a year, so welcome back. Thanks. So you guys get me after lunch, which means you can all take a nap. Um, let me just see if I can get this up and running. quite tricky to move the mouse from down here, actually. All right, so um, as the introductor introduction said, I'm from Google. I work on the Google public policy team, and I know this is a fairly technical audience. Um, I fashion myself as a bit more of a practitioner uh, than some of the talks that we heard this morning. Um, I've been at Google for about six years and working on privacy for most of that time. It's been quite a ride. And what I want to talk to you about today is um, the way that I, at least, have come to think about privacy. Someone was saying over lunch, no one Googler can represent the whole company, and that is certainly true. Um, but hopefully this will give you a sense of some of the challenges that, that we are really focused on in the privacy space going into, um, going into 2015. So I, uh, I was here about three years ago giving a talk about privacy and data innovation, and I was making the point when I started then about Google in 2000, 2001, right? This is what it looked like. You don't recognize it now. Um, it's really hard to imagine that Larry and Sergey had really any idea what they were building back in 2001, and the innovation since then has just been tremendous. But what they built back then was a search engine for a desktop browser. So you went to Google search, and it knew that you were from some IP address, maybe had a cookie, um, and you typed in a search term and it stored some record of that transaction. You probably weren't signing in to many things online back in 2001. You were getting your email down through, through, um, through the SMTP into a client. You weren't sort of going to webmail. And that has all changed dramatically in the last five to eight years. So this is Google today, right? And there's a couple things to notice about this. It's mobile. This is Google Now. Does any, how many of you use Google Now? A few hands. So you sign up for Google now, right? You say, yes, I, I actually want this. I want you to use my information that's in my Google account to give me things that are useful to me right now. So it's, you know, tell me when I need to start my commute and what the traffic is going to look like. Tell me what the weather is going to be today. You know that I'm taking a plane. Just give me the boarding pass right there on my mobile phone. This is a very different experience than the Google of 10 years ago. Um, it's not just Google, right? Everything is mobile. I think that's sort of the first major change to keep in mind. And everything is signed in. And this is something, this is also another significant change, right? So all of these sites, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Dropbox, even Amazon, and that's a desktop Amazon, but certainly Amazon mobile, you're signing in every single time. And that is a very significant change in how we need to think about privacy online because the, the transaction with your IP address is no longer the, the thing to care about. It's the information that you're storing in an account when you sign in. Um, it's actually sort of amazing uh, to think about that change in a more significant way. For me, what it means is that you can't have privacy without security anymore. The two things are um, in intricately linked um, forever going forward. And I think you know, everyone in the room can sort of imagine why this is on the, on the screen. 
Obviously, Jennifer Lawrence and all the other celebrities whose photos were leaked onto the web would say that the insecurity of those accounts where they had stored those photos was the issue, right? If the, if the information had been kept secure, then it would have been kept private and the privacy invasion never would have happened. And these types of incidents are growing much more common. Um, there are some researchers in Europe that found that since 20, uh, 2005, there have been roughly 230 data breaches accounting for 641 million personal records being breached, um, which is significant. You've probably all seen the news about the 100,000 Snapchat images that leaked out onto the web. Um, and you've surely read about the bugs like Heartbleed that you know, have been noticed um, in the past year and are very, very significant security threats for the web. Um, consumers are very worried about this, unsurprisingly. Uh, in fact, they're more worried about their accounts being hacked than they are about their home being broken into. So the other interesting aspect of this, of course, is how many places we're signing into, how many accounts that you are worried about having hacked. Um, LastPass, which is one of these um, password storage companies, has estimated that um, the average consumer has roughly 100 accounts online that they're using. I think for yourself how many you have, and very quickly the numbers add up, and you realize there's no way that you're remembering 100 passwords, especially if those passwords are actually good passwords, if they're actually using random strings of text, and there's capital letters and lowercase letters and numbers, there's no way you're remembering them all. Um, and this is a, a fairly well-known problem, but it's amazing to me how little is being done to solve it. I was at a um, stationery store probably a month ago, which is unusual for me, I live in digital now, right? So I was at the stationery store wandering around and I was shocked to see on the wall where there used to be sort of leather bound diaries 10 years ago for sort of managing your calendar, there were leather bound password books. Everyone in this room knows how terrible an idea that is. And there, there's somebody like making money off of the the notion that consumers don't know how to keep themselves safe online. It's, it's terrifying. Um, hopefully you've all read Matt Honan's piece from 2012 on, um, on the failure of passwords to keep information secure online. Uh, in the past year, I was just reading this morning, in the past year more than 3.3 million passwords were leaked. And it turns out that even still, it's two years after this article and it's 2015, like we've known this is a problem. The two most common passwords are password, and one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, it's, it's a problem that we just cannot forget exists. Um, and the reason that it is such a problem is um, it's becoming more and more of a problem, frankly, because computational strength is going up. There was a German researcher a couple years ago who, dis who demonstrated that he could test, sort of brute force test, 400,000 passwords per second. And it was only gonna cost him 28 cents a minute. And that was a couple of years ago, right? So imagine the ability to brute force attack passwords. It's just simply not gonna work. And I, I, I love this screenshot. I, it, you've got the bouncy ball Google, right? And we always sort of think of Google as a big fluffy dog that kind of stumbles around. And we are at war. And we really are at war against account hijacking. If you've paid any attention to Google insecurity in the past few years, you will have seen announcement after announcement after announcement of things that we are doing to protect users' accounts. It started with China, but it continues. Um, and the interesting thing for me about this in the context of a symposium about privacy is the number of pieces of data that actually help us do this. So we currently now look at over 120 um, pieces of information that are signals to us in determining whether an account looks like it's suspicious, whether a login attempt looks like it's suspicious. Since 2011, when we really started going after this in full force, we believe that we've reduced the number of compromised accounts at Google by 99%. We've also offered two-factor authentication, and hopefully everyone in this room uses two-factor authentication um, and knows sort of what it is, but for those who don't, it enables you to get a second verification code. So you enter your password, but then on your mobile phone, you get a second code and you then have to enter that code. And the theory behind this, of course, is hackers and people who steal passwords usually work from far away. So the likelihood that they have access to your phone is very low. Um, and this generally uh, increases security a great deal. 
when there are highly publicized incidents, so things like that Matt Honan piece, or if there's like a password dump that gets covered in the news, Google sees that signups for two-factor authentication, we have as many in one day as we would get normally in a month. So consumers get it and they care. It's just, it's an awareness problem. Um, and Google is not the only company that is sort of working at this. There's actually a site, it's, I think it's twofactorauth.org, hopefully you can read that better than me, that actually goes and checks all the services that you might use and has the list of services is enormous and tells you which ones have two-factor authentication and which ones don't. Most of the consumer sites you're using now, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, eBay, they all have two-factor authentication now, which is generally a step in the right direction. Um, but it only solves part of the problem, right? So one of, one of the more common ways that you get your account hijacked is, um, is a phishing attempt. And two-factor authentication doesn't actually solve that because somebody pretending to be the site that you're logging into would just get your password and the second factor. So Google in October released something that we're calling Security Key. Um, this is a little USB thing. I have it in my laptop here, and I'm just going to show you because you can barely see it. And it stays in my laptop, it's, it's just a little USB entry. And when I go and sign into Google now, I enter my password and I just tap this little key. And again, it operates on this assumption that the hacker is working from far away. The thing the key does is it makes sure that the site I'm at is actually Google before it does anything else. And so it's, it's solving both the second authentication problem, but also the verification problem of who's on the other side. The other mission that we're really on here in, um, in 2015 is encrypting all of our services. Again, we've been doing this for, for many years. In 2010, I believe, we started encrypting Gmail by default. And in 2011, we started encrypting Search by default. And we are um, unabashedly moving towards encrypting every single one of our services. The reason, of course, that encryption is so important, we all know that it is, despite the sort of weaknesses that were discussed earlier this morning, it is still the best way to prevent everyday law-abiding consumers um, who may lose their phones, who may have, be at risk of identity theft or financial fraud. And, and given the scale of the traffic that, that Google is managing now, this is not a small effort for us to undertake. It's not something we can do overnight, but we are investing significantly in it. We're also working really hard to encourage other websites to move towards encryption. Again, the, the security of the web is a, is a web-wide ecosystem problem. Um, one of the ways that we're doing that is we've added uh, security as a ranking factor in search. So an HTTPS site will actually have a, a boost to their ranking. Um, the other thing that we've done, and this is for email, of course, and email still is one of the most common ways that people share private information online. Um, this is a picture of our transparency report. We launched this earlier this year and it shows the number of emails that we see coming into Gmail that are actually encrypted. You probably all know this, but of course it matters because if Gmail is encrypted but the email server that you're sending to is not, you've lost everything, right? It's the endpoint problem and the encryption that Gmail provided you is not worth a whole lot. So we started calling out um, you know, the fact that we weren't seeing all of our traffic being encrypted to and from Gmail. There was one other data point I wanted to give you here. Yes, in the past year we've seen that encryption has risen from 30% to 70% in these graphs, um, which is a pretty phenomenal rise. Um, this speaks to the fact that this is an ecosystem problem and I think the Sony hack does as well. Um, and I really liked this one in particular because look at what he's holding. You've all seen like Kim Jong-il looking at things, right? This is the new Kim Jong-il looking at things is he needs a binocular to look at the com computer screen. Like I just find it very funny. Um, Sony is not the kind of company that you think of as storing a lot of personal data. It's not Twitter, it's not Facebook. They do have the PlayStation, but we think of them as making movies. And um, they were still the victim of a very sophisticated cyber attack that leaked a lot of confidential information. It damaged their business, of course. I was just reading today that um, Sony has had to delay their financial reporting a month because it's going to take that long to get their accounting systems built back up. But there was also personal privacy that was at stake here, right? So people's emails were leaked out to the web, and these are individual Sony employees who, in the normal course of business, were sending emails as part of their job. And because of this hack, those emails were leaked out onto the web. And so, again, this, this really is about privacy. We can't separate the two, the two issues. 
Um, Google sees ourselves as really a significant player online. We sort of recognize that there's a responsibility that comes with that. This is a, a, a picture of effectively Google safe browsing. Safe browsing is an API that we make freely available. Um, and what we do is we go out and scour all of the websites on the web to identify sites that have malware or appear to be um, associated with phishing attacks. And then we have a list of all those sites. And the API, again, it's made available. So you see Firefox and Apple Safari are both using this to identify dangerous sites and warn the user, you're about to go to a site that may harm you. Um, we currently display around 20 million warnings a week. Um, and there's probably 1.1 billion plus people who are protected by this technology. Again, in the context of privacy, this one's pretty interesting. Six or seven years ago, privacy, you'd hear the first thing out of people's mind is the information collection is the problem. But safe browsing is a great example of information collection that actually increases privacy by making us more secure. Um, we also launched, I know th th there's a number of folks in the room who work on differential privacy. We heard Cynthia talk about it this morning. This is, I don't know very much about this, so somebody is gonna tell us more later, but Google in October announced a, um, a research project called Rapport, R-A-P-P-O-R, which is, we've, we've put it out there as an open source tool, and our research team believes it's one of the first practical methods to actually implement differential pri privacy in practice. So we're working really hard at, at solving the problem of, okay, you collect all this data, how can you learn interesting things from it without identifying the individual data points? Um, and that is sort of where, I think, you know, as you've heard this morning, where things are, are going. Um, we also invest significant resources in security as a whole. Some of you may have seen um, news stories a couple of weeks ago about a Microsoft bug that we that we made public. That was part of Project Zero. Um, this is a team that was created just in July of 2014, and it's full-time security researchers whose job, full-time, is to identify bugs in other software. Um, and they practice responsible disclosure, meaning I think 60 days or 90 days is our standard disclosure period. So they identify a bug, they contact the vendor, and they work with that vendor to fix it within a reasonable period of time. Um, that Microsoft bug wasn't fixed in the reasonable period of time, which is why you saw that disclosure happen the way it did. Um, this brings me to another point, which is um, there's bad stuff online, right? It's just technology. It's not good or bad. Humanity has got its ups and downs. Malware exists, phishing occurs, um, spam occurs, and bad actors use the internet. Since there's been fire, there has also been arson. And as the role of the internet has grown, so too have the activities of these bad actors. So some of the same technology that is enabling creativity and sharing and discovery and sort of all the wonderful things that the web has created, it can also be co-opted in an effort to radicalize people, to incite hatred, to spread dangerous propaganda, and to organize attacks. Um, reports that the murderers of a British soldier publicly planned their crimes on social media or the use of those same channels by ISIS to recruit jihadists or post videos of their acts have brought further scrutiny to technology's role in these situations. Officials in Europe and the US have called on the technology sector to lend more of a hand in combating these sorts of crimes. And obviously the technology sector has a responsibility here. Unfortunately, some of the proposals that are surfacing are suggestions that companies should create backdoors for governments to access encrypted data. And there are more suggestions to continue weakening the security protections that companies are offering consumers today. Um, they've also called for banning certain platforms altogether. You probably saw this about WhatsApp and David Cameron, the Prime Minister of the UK, suggesting that WhatsApp just be banned outright. Um, they, you know, there's of course a legitimate and important role for governments and for the companies to play here in um, fighting crime and protecting people, um, people's safety. But I think as you heard this morning, most people would argue that, maybe not most people, most people in this room probably would argue, the governments um, getting the information they need to protect us does not require undermining the kinds of security technologies that are intended to keep people safe, and it doesn't require mass surveillance. Um, how many people know what this is? Just a handful. This is the Clipper chip. And a lot of folks are thinking that we are going back into the 1990s encryption wars because of 
um, because of the comments that you're seeing coming out of these governments. Um, in September or October, Android and, um, and the iPhone started encrypting by default on the hard drive of the, of the, the mobile phone. And you saw the US government come out and say that in, this was terrible, it was impeding law enforcement. It's just not true. Um, as uh, US, US courts had done a study in July of 2014, and looking at 3,500 investigations found that encryption had foiled only nine of them. And so the, the fears here are being way overblown, and we all know that encryption is the 21st century of method of protecting our personal information. Um, <clears throat> Law enforcement officials actually have all the ways that they need to obtain information in the course of an investigation through proper legal channels. They can obtain call records or text messages from a telecom provider. Um, with a valid court order or warrant, they can obtain emails, photos, documents from Google, from Facebook, whichever company they need that is storing the data. Um, and instead of following those legal channels, unfortunately, there's increasing evidence that they are conducting mass surveillance. And you've actually seen in recent weeks calls for more mass surveillance out of Europe. Um, so this, this idea that mass surveillance is, is not the answer has not gone away. People still think it is. Google was obviously surprised and shocked at the Snowden revel revelations. Um, particularly the assertion that the government had a backdoor into our systems. As we've said time and again, it is simply untrue. There was no backdoor, trapdoor, or side door into Google systems. Um, we don't allow governments to install equipment on our networks or property that gives them access to user data. Um, various governments, of course, including European governments, have asked us to install those types of technologies, and we have always refused. We were further surprised by reports that intelligence agencies had been eavesdropping on traffic moving between our internal data centers. And that was, you know, we moved to encrypt all of that traffic immediately. And of course, all of our system services as I was talking about earlier. Unfortunately, the PRISM revelations weren't just damaging for one company, they were damaging for the entire internet at large and for the US government's relation, relationship with Europe. They also sparked a very important debate about privacy and security today online. Um, and we believe that all of these governments need to start working together to preserve civil liberties while also protecting national security. Surveillance programs, um, this, is, this is an alliance of tech companies that's been advocating for surveillance reform globally since the Snowden revelations. And our belief is that they should operate under a legal framework that is rule-bound, narrowly tailored, transparent, and subject to oversight. Um, and we've been pushing the US government very hard for reform of those surveillance laws close, and to close all of the, the loopholes. We were also the first company to um, publish information about government requests that we receive around the world. We did that in 2010, and we continue to publish that every six months um, in our transparency report. And you've now seen many, many companies uh, follow our lead, and this is becoming an industry standard. But despite all of these efforts, unfortunately, we seem to be moving into an era where technology companies are synonymous with the United States and by proxy with the United States government's surveillance practices. It's simply not the case, and it may have much more detrimental consequences for the internet than many people realize. This is the cover of a, of a book by um, two academics on the effect of data localization efforts around the world, and these are proposals coming out of governments in most countries in the world at this point to require that all data that's collected in that country be stored in that country. Um, he's done a, a lot of really good case studies in here, but the efforts are really sorely misguided. The idea that the legal protections are tied to where the bits of data reside is frankly absurd on its face, but that is what these governments are trying to solve by requiring that the data come in and stay in the country. Um, in fact, this will actually harm security if you see data localization take hold. Um, it increases what experts would call the attack surface, offering more opportunities for bad guys to get hold of data. It also is just a scale factor. Getting security right takes expertise, resources, and commitment. And compelling businesses to use local hosting rather than global hosting or their own sort of hosting services, increases the likelihood that we'll end up with relatively weaker security protections. There are only so many security experts in the world that you can hire. Um, it's incredibly scarce to find that kind of expertise, and um, the shared resources enable people to, to sort of achieve security at scale. 
instead of focusing on where the data is located and trying to sort of lock that down, we should be focusing on how to um, protect users' privacy rights across geographic boundaries. There's actually a really good framework for this already. It's the OECD privacy principles from 1980. And they're international. They've been adopted by many, many governments around the world in terms of the laws that protect personal data. And the principles remain relevant today. Um, arguably, uh, these principles are more relevant today than ever. And the internet has made it actually easier to implement at least some of them. One of the main principles is, uh, is control, the ability for you as an individual to access, correct, or delete, revoke consent for the storage of your personal information. Um, and the internet has actually made this easier. You don't have to necessarily call a company anymore. You don't have to sort of send email and ask them to do something with your data. Um, companies like Google and Facebook have given you these controls. I won't spend too much time on it because I'm running out, and I think you're fairly familiar with these. Um, but they aren't marketing gimmicks. Uh, at Google, 10 million users check their account history settings every week, and about 2.5 million are actually making changes. So these are, these are really meaningful, meaningful controls. I know you're all thinking about advertising. Um, it's already come up once today, and the notion that these companies are selling data. We're not. Um, we don't sell user data. We don't share it with third parties without the user's permission, unless it's you know, the case of a government compelling us to hand it over. Our search business remains the core of our business, and these ads are based on a search query and where you're searching from, and that's about it. Um, there just isn't that much information that we're collecting to monetize. It's, it's really not as sort of complicated as people make it out to be. Um, the huge, huge success of our ads business just doesn't require that much information. And we do give users control over their ad settings as well. So you can go into to our ad settings page and change all of the information. You can opt out of seeing interest-based ads. And that's been with us since we actually started serving interest-based ads. Um, we also give users a very meaningful choice to leave, which is Google Takeout. And this is another thing that ought to become industry standard, the ability to, to download your data in a standard format and take it to another service. And the reason that it should become industry standard is it facilitates competition. And without that competition, you wouldn't see the services springing up that you're seeing today in terms of privacy protecting features that the big companies weren't offering. Um, the competition is what sort of facilitates that type of innovation. A conceptual remark just to close. Um, this is, you know, in some ways privacy is a secondary concept and the really interesting question that I think we'll deal with in the next few years is identity um, and what that means and how you construct it online. And with that, having run a bit over time, I will close. Thank you. We have time for a few. Okay. Sorry, we have time for a couple of questions. I could say a lot about the right to be forgotten. Um, so we have worked very hard to comply with that ruling that was handed down by the court in May. Uh, we have also sought input from experts and the public across Europe on how to implement it. And we are working very hard to implement it. We don't think the ruling was very good. Um, and you know, in, in many cases, it puts us in a somewhat difficult position of making this trade off. But that is sort of where we, where we stand on it. Do you really think that the North Koreans did the Sony hack? <laughs> I have no idea. I was going on the comments from someone earlier this morning who I thought probably knew. <laughs> Any other questions? One more? Do you want to go? Okay, go. Yeah. I can, I'll repeat your question. Go ahead. Mm. So the question was about the centralization versus decentralization of security protections. Um, I don't know that I think that that's really the relevant sort of distinction to be making, uh, but I admit that I'm actually not a security expert. I'm a bit more of a privacy expert, so I don't have too many thoughts on it. Should we take one more? Yes. Last one. Uh, oh. Okay, there's one and then Salim. <laughs> 
Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, so Google itself doesn't use a lot of data to personalize advertising, but the advertising industry in and of itself is considered one of the creepiest in the way it uses personal information and the way you know products follow you around the web. Is Google active within um, the advertising industry um, to make those practices more private, give users more control, or make it just less creepy, which I would think would be in the advertiser's best interests? Yes, short answer. Uh, the slightly more complicated answer, I'll just give you one more one example, which is that almost all of our ads now on the display networks, or third-party ads, um, have a mute this ad function, so you can click it and say you don't want to see that ad campaign anymore from that advertiser. We're looking at a lot of different innovations like that to sort of continue the ad business's success, but do it in a more sensitive way to user control. Are there... Um any places uh, that you would, or an example you'd, you'd call out where the the tech industry needs to make a really difficult choice? There's something really cool that we're able to do, and you know, for for many people, would be a great benefit, but it really is, you know, bordering on uh, or possibly crossing the line to in, in terms of people's comfort with uh, privacy. Where where would you see you know some of those challenges uh. right now? So we were talking at lunch, someone said at lunch to me, Google knows so much about me, and I don't really like that. It can predict my behavior better than anyone. I sort of pushed back on the notion because I don't actually think that it's really quite true. Um, and I think that you know, in 10 or 15 years, the ability of some of these companies to analyze that data and know a fair bit may actually be far more advanced than we can even understand today. And I would say that going forward in that type of a time frame, a 15-year time frame, there, there will end up being um, conversations around the ethical use of data that are, that are vastly different than the ones that we're having today. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thank you. Yes. And our next uh, speaker is Lee Rainey. He's the director of Internet Science and Technology at uh, Pew Research Center. Uh, since uh, a few of the speakers today uh, mentioned their books, I'm going to mention also the Lee co-author of Network, The New Social System. Uh, and he's also a Harvard graduate, so welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. It's a real honor to be here, um, not least because I, I don't come advocating for anything. Pew, um, my part of Pew, describes itself as a, as a fact tank. Uh, we are about uh, social science uh, data, but we are we, um, generated in ways that we hope are useful to you, but we don't come at, from a point of view. We're not privacy advocates. We're not corporate advocates. We don't have positions on policies and things like that. And my mission today is to describe the imprecise, messy, paradoxical, and challenging way that Americans think about and talk about privacy. Um, I am going to talk about some grand themes first before I get to some of the specific data that um, are, are our stock and trade. So the, overall, in the years that we've been studying privacy, and it's been since the year 2000, uh, one of the main things is that privacy in the American imagination is not an on or an off proposition. It is highly context-driven, highly dependent on the conditions right at hand as people are making decisions about whether to disclose or not to disclose. And it, different people uh, have different positions on the same set of facts, and the same people have different positions on the same set of facts given where they are in their life and the set of circumstances that they're in. So they want to adjust the dial about where they are public and sharing and when they are private and anonymous. Personal control is a dominant feature as people think about this. It's not the right to be left alone anymore. It's the right to be in control of what people understand about you, what organizations understand about you, how, what kind of sharing is done, who has access to your data, and if you can correct mistakes uh, that others make about you. Again, it's, it's, I think it, Betsy's last point is a really interesting point about identity. This is Americans controlling who other people and other organizations think they are. Uh, Trade-offs are part of the bargain now. Most Americans, when you talk to them about these things, are quite transactional. 
they understand that a bargain in many cases is being offered. They get something in return for disclosure or being monitored. Sometimes it's safety, sometimes it's a deal, sometimes it's efficiency. There are a whole host of things going on and most Americans, again, in that spirit of, of being context driven, want to uh, sort of engage at the moment that they are offered things. Um, one of the things that people just don't understand about this world and is just abundant in our data is that young people, particularly people between age about 15 and about age 30, are much more tuned in to the realities of networked privacy than their elders are. By all sorts of metrics, yes, they share more things than their elders do, but they are at the same time much more vigilant about the terms of that sharing, about monitoring what other people in their networks say about them, and just generally being more aware of the consequences of the information that's swirling around about them. So this notion that young people are indifferent to privacy, that they're narcissistic and they want to share more than anybody in the, human, uh, in the course of human history is just not true. A dominant feature of privacy realities for Americans is that they know that they don't know what's going on. I'll show you a whole bunch of data from us later on that speaks to uh, what seems like a grand paradox in the findings. Uh, at the one level, Americans, when you talk to them about, about privacy, as a, as a concept, they love it, they care about it, it's deeply embedded in their cultural DNA, and it's something that they think is precious. And yet, they live their lives in many ways as if that weren't true, that it didn't necessarily hold a preeminent uh, place in their value structure. And sometimes what you hear, uh, particularly from uh, corporations about this, is, well, the reality of how they live is more different, is, is different and more meaningful than the values that they articulate. But in fact, some of the reality is embedded in this notion, that they don't necessarily know what's being captured about them, they don't necessarily know what bargains are being struck in their name, and they are, that's what's making them particularly worried about the, the context of information now. And then in our recent work, in the past couple of years, especially since the first news stories about the uh, Snowden revelations, but then cascading through security breaches, the North Korea Sony event, all sorts of ways Americans are losing hope at their capacity to influence these conversations, at the capacity to be uh, in control of their data, and in the capacity of institutions to serve their best interests, even when they trust those institutions. So uh, sort of the, the sort of grand thought that dominates a lot of what we're doing when we're surveying the public and what we're learning from them is that they know that the balance of forces have shifted in, the, in a generation um, and that there's a special character now to networked information that didn't exist when information was more linear than it, was, than it is now, and that networked individuals are different beings from the people who lived in very tight-knit by in societies that were dominated by tight-knit social groups like families, villages, and things like that, and by big hierarchical organizations. It's a different and networked world where people are agents on their own in different ways. They can do more things uh, that they, than they used to do, but they're forced to do more things than they used to do that institutions uh, might have been accomplishing for them. And so I love this thought uh, that my friend Dana Boyd articulates so beautifully that the modern condition is that we are public by default and private by effort. And that changes the, the value proposition of what's going on and it changes the way we're related to institutions. Now, I'm going to assume my regular pew role and start laying uh, data on you. Everything that's in red in these slides is a brand new finding from us. It, it's, these are data literally that I saw last week for the first time. We have not published reports off them, but I thought they were particularly relevant for these conversations. Uh, speaking to the notion that I just articulated about relative hopelessness, we asked people in a recent survey, on a typical day, how much control do you have over information that is collected about you and how it is used? And it's an even break. 47% uh, say they think they have a lot of control or some control. 50% say not much control or no control at all. It's this, again, this is a sense that it's omnipresent. The, the way the data is captured, the way that people are shedding data, and it's not at all clear about what's happening to it after it leaves their provenance. I've structured this talk in, in, in three ways because I think the nature of surveillance itself uh, has changed. And, uh, and you might have noticed in the title of my talk, 
Surveillance is the common way that people are, are thinking about being monitored and tracked, that the powerful French word sur is above. So the powerful, the people above, get to look at the less powerful, the people who don't have all of the, uh, the tools of power of their societies. Suvalence, S-O-U-S, is the French word for below, and it's a, it's a neologism that a University of Toronto professor articulated, that these, uh, the modern world now gives citizens, or relatively less powerful people, an opportunity to monitor and, and to oversee and to call out more powerful people and institutions. And covalence is the condition we all live in when we exist in social networks now, especially those that are reified technologically. That we are sharing information about each other, we are surveilling each other in a pretty benign sense of the term. It's not necessarily malevolent at all, but it's certainly the case that we can share things about each other that we don't have control over. And that once it's left the context of the immediate exchange of information, a picture taken of me, or a conversation that's repeated uh, on Facebook or something like that, the context of that sharing uh, can collapse or can be misconstrued in very different kinds of contexts. So I'm going to start with this surveillance story. These are data that were gathered by Pew political pollsters. You know, a big part of our enterprise at Pew Research is to do uh, polling on politics and social policy. And these were, this is a series of polls that we did um, after the Snowden revelations. And you'll see that at the very beginning, um, the public, particularly when you uh, were asking them about whether they were, the, the context was whether the country was being protected or not, as opposed to civil liberties being protected. Most people were okay, or more people were thinking that the bargain was, uh, they were not going enough to um, protect the, the country. Uh, so most people were worried in the early days of the Snowden revelations that, that actually that more might needed to be done. Now, of course, that has flipped. The last line in here is that more people now say they've gone too far in restricting civil liberties. In uh, some more recent polling that we did, 80% of adults agree, said they agree or strongly agree that Americans should be concerned about the government's monitoring of phone calls and internet communications. And when we asked a contextual question, compared to the way you've been thinking over time, how do you feel now? 54% of adults have become less confident over time that the surveillance programs are serving the public interest. There are ways in which people now are, are somewhat suspicious of exactly what's going on, and a significant portion of people, in this case 56%, uh, say the courts do not provide adequate limits on data collection. 70% say that the material that's collected can also uh, be used not only for anti-terror um, investigations, but for other purposes. They're not necessarily sure that the data the collection is confined to that. Um, they're also um, uh, worried that the content itself of emails and the content of phone calls is being monitored. 27% uh, said uh, the government has listened to their calls or read their emails. So there's a portion of the population that has moved beyond some of the assurances and other references to these programs and are basically assuming that um, some core communications functions of theirs are being monitored. Uh, so in the recent survey, again, we just got these data back last week, do you think the courts and judges do a good job balancing the public's rights to privacy and the needs of law enforcement and intelligence agencies to collect information for investigations? Split verdict again. 48% uh, said yes, 49% said no. Here's a, sorry, this slide is maybe a little crowded for you, but it's a, it's a, it's a pulling together of data showing, again, that young people conceive of and uh, react to privacy differently from their elders. So um, uh, in the far right column there is the point difference between younger adults, those 18 to 29, and adults over age 65. And you can just see privacy um, opinions just track with age. So young people are much more likely to say in, in our polls that um, anti-terrorism policies have gone too far in restricting civil liberties. 27 uh, point higher difference between them and uh, older folks who say that they, uh, the policies have not restricted civil liberties. Then young people, again, are much more likely to say, yes, uh, should media reports uh, secret methods the government is using to fight terrorism? In other words, was, were the Snowden revelations, there was a big debate early on, should news media have covered that? Was, was that good or bad uh, for the culture? Young people are much more likely to say it was good that reporters reported that. 
They disagree more likely than their elders when the issue is news media reports can harm anti-terrorism programs. So young people are tw uh, 20 points less likely uh, than adults to, to, uh, older adults to say that uh, that harm takes place. Should government keeps too much information about any terrorism program secret. Uh, young people are 13 points higher than their elders in saying that. And government collection of phone and internet data as part of any terrorism efforts, do they approve of it? Young people are 20 points higher than older folks. The margin for error is, is 2.5 percent. These are uh, uh, representative samples of the general public that are taken both on landline and cell phones. Uh, margin of error, the sample that size is about 2.5, 2.6 percent. Um, this is um, uh, uh, data that uh, President Obama cited in his speech at the Federal Trade Commission last week talking about uh, encouraging the Trade Commission to begin uh, more robust uh, privacy uh, policy making. 91 percent of Americans are, uh, have feel that, um, that they agree or strongly agree that uh, consumers have lost control over how their personal data is collected and used by companies. Uh, two-thirds uh, of internet users say current laws are not good enough. And close to two-thirds say government should do more to regulate advertisers. So again, it, partly people are saying that they, the system has sort of spun out of control in their imaginations, and they think that um, additional government laws and rulemaking probably would make sense. Um, on the other hand, they are still pr very willing to, to, to be in this transactional frame of mind. These, this is one example of it, but there are multiple examples of it in our data. More than half agree or strongly agree, I agree. I'm willing to share some information about myself with companies in order to use online services uh, for free. Here's a, um, the way that we measured the knowledge question. So we are now sort of looking at ways in which people do and don't know what's happening in this environment. So we had a little... Uh, web knowledge quiz um, uh, that we administered to it, a representative sample of the public. Uh, and we, we gave this true or false question. When a company posts a privacy policy, it ensures that the company keeps confidential all the information it collects on users. 44% of people gave the right answer. 52% gave the wrong answer. That's a higher number that gave the wrong answer than when the similar question was asked by Professor Joe Turow at Penn in the early 2000s. So in some respects, the, the, the assumption that when you declare yourselves having a privacy policy, that's something that means you're going to protect consumer data is, uh, is actually gaining public currency when, in fact, it's not true. Um, and then here are, are, again, these latest data. When we ask people about specific kinds of privacy protection strategies, um, th these are what we found. Yep. 39% uh, don't know about anonymity software, such as Tor. 37% don't know about locally networked communications, such as FireChat. A third uh, don't know about email encryption. And a third don't know about um, uh, browser plugins that allow them not to be tracked. No, there, there, there are a lot of there are a lot of don't knows too. A lot of I don't want to answer, even answer that question. So you bump those up about five or six points per. Um, if you if you assume that the people who are refusing to answer the question are not comfortable, um, that they don't want to admit that they don't know the answer. Um, so in surveillance, it's a, it's a different uh, phenomenon that affects network privacy. Uh, these are Gallup data about trust and confidence in American institutions. And so one of the ways that, you know, the, the way I've articulated surveillance is it us looking at powerful institutions. And I wish I could have uh, reproduced a, uh, a graph over time, but what's going on here is that since the early 1970s, when Gallup has been asking these questions, every institution has gone down in public estimation except one, the U.S. military. And there are two others in other data sets that I know about. Librarians are still holding their own, and firefighters are still holding their own. Um, but everything else has gone down, and it's partly a, a, a reflection of the networked world where people now, trust has shifted from institutional actors to people's networks. They rely on their networks for all sorts of, of ways to share information, to validate information, to be the recipients of information, and things like that. But it's, again, sort of a, a reflection of people wanting to um, hold their institutions to pretty high standards and using new tools to, to judge them. Um, and we, again, we just asked these data about their, people's confidence in a variety of, of organizations to preserve their records and not be hacked, basically. So this is right in the middle of, of all sorts of concerns about security. We get very wide and very systemic readings that people are losing or have 
don't have much confidence to begin with in companies to protect uh, their records. At the bottom of the list is online advertisers. At the top of the list, uh, just under half of people are not confident that those institutions can keep their records. So the sense of vulnerability is, is pervasive in the American public. Um, a lot of people now are turning to open government uh, and open data to try to begin to understand what's going on and maybe figure out how well the government's performing, what kind of data is being collected and things like that. These are data uh, that basically two-thirds of Americans have now used some sort of mechanism to find out from government data sources and information sources what's going on uh, with the government. But not many people uh, think the government is doing a too terribly good job of sharing uh, the things that it does and the things that it knows. Uh, so there's a lot more room for growth and there's gonna be a lot more pressure because transparency and the demands for transparency are a, um, one of the markers now of trust that people have in institutions. If they're not transparent, if they're not sharing what they know, if there aren't human beings at the other end of the exchange, Americans are now tending to hold it against them. Finally, in covalence, this is the new condition that we're all in where we're back to the village, where everybody more or less knows our business in the era where we're pervasively available to each other and persistently connected uh, to each other. Um, so people still want to be anonymous. They want to turn that dial for being disclosing or not, but they're not confident that they can be anonymous anymore. Uh, more than half of Americans, 59%, do not believe it's possible to be confident. Part of the reason is that they know lots of information about them through one method or another is available. Uh, lots of people now have a sense. There are photos of them, their email addresses, their home addresses, their employers um, are available um, online. And one of the most interesting things that speaks to this notion of covalence, that when people are trying to think about being anonymous, we ask them, who, who are you trying to hide from? And of course, hackers and advertisers are at the top of the list here. But the next cluster of things uh, down here are social, um, are, are social um, worries that people have. They don't want to necessarily be known to their spouses and to their children and to their significant others and to their bosses and to their best friends. They're not thinking about the government and law enforcement as they're trying to be anonymous. It's at the bottom of, their li of the list and it's just not, it's certainly from, from the point of view of being top of mind, when people are thinking about being anonymous, they're not thinking about government, they're thinking about their buddies um, and, their, and their reputations. The other reality of online life, of course, is that there are ways that people can make horrible um, the lives of, of others. 40% of American adults have experienced, 40% of internet users have experienced harassment. It tends to be younger women who experience the worst kinds of harassment. And so these tools are now used to do life invasions that weren't nearly as possible in, in the pre-internet age. Um, and young adults are more likely to have had more general problems. They've had attacks, uh, they've had attacks on, and successful attacks on their accounts. They've been harassed. They've been, um, had reputational damage that has affected them in sco at, at school or a job, or they've been in physical danger. Um, a lot of people now, partly in response to the knowing that they're out there, is that they, um, uh, they, they check on themselves. Reputation management is now a part of the normal way that people are trying to achieve networked relationships as well as network privacy. About two-thirds of people have Googled their name and to see what's available. Um, and the expectation now for most people when they encounter other folks is that the person that they're encountering, even for the first time, has checked up on them or that, and they will have checked up on the person that they're encountering. So again, this way that we are much more exposed to each other is, a, is a, an elemental part of covalence. And, and then people are, are just sort of um, speaking to their own insufficiencies on this. About 61% uh, they would, they would uh, say they would like to do more uh, when it comes to privacy. Uh, they know that they're not doing enough. They're, they're, they know that they don't know about the tools that are available. And they'd love the chance to get reputational damage turned back. I mean, it was really interesting part of the conversation this morning about whether information theory can help us on this. I don't know if it's, if it's enshrined in theory yet, but one of the technological ways that people are fighting back is to try to flood the zone and upvote themselves. So it's not entropy that's, that's, that's causing information to sort of, and reputational damage to be, to be a problem. It's people are trying to ma massage their reputations in ways with these technologies to make sure that their best face is, is facing forward. 
And when you ask people about the future of technology uh, and, and privacy, um, it's, it's, they're very discouraged. We've just completed a series of focus groups, and our last question is, what do you think is the future of privacy? And everybody expresses this sort of hopeless point of view. And they're partly hopeless because of their own insufficiencies or worries, and they're partly very discouraged about younger Americans uh, like this. But it's, I, I, and I, so I hope that, you know, um, uh, our data eventually will be understood that young folks are, are more engaged in the conversations that we're having today than older folks, as a rule, generally are. But I also remember back to the early 2000s when I, we began to do privacy work, and I would go out and give speeches and saying, these data are very clear. Americans are anxious. They've got concerns. And something is going to happen to trigger them. There's going to be the Exxon Valdez equivalent of a data spill that will send everybody with pitchforks to the FTC to fix all the problems. Well, we've been through how many Exxon Valdez's since then, and the pitchforks aren't out and things aren't there. So I'm not quite sure how, um, how Americans even, they, this hopelessness is the th thing I keep coming back to. They're not even sure that they can affect the pathway of the future. It's nice to be able to say, though, that there, I know that there's stuff that's happening at the Berkman Center. Doc Searles and especially is thinking about vendor relationship management tools. There's wonderful, uh, exciting work being done at the W3C uh, consortium about giving people their own capacity to shape um, what people know, what people in organizations know about them, uh, and tools on this. There are probably other things, I'm sure, that are going on at Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon and places like this. So um, you, you've got a job in this room to do, to convince people that they ought to have hope and they, ought, they will have tools and that, that in some way, again, they can recapture um, their identities. So thank you very much. And I'll take maybe one or two questions. for all this great data, new data. Um, any questions? Yes. Um, you study privacy, but you're also a participant in some of these transactions. And Hugh goes out and asks people lots and lots of questions. Yeah. Has there been any change in the number of people who basically say none of your business? Has there been change? We're pollsters. Have people started turning against pollsters? And the answer is yes. Um, and it's, it's, it's a couple of things, uh, and it's, the, the numbers are that um, when, I, when I began 15 years ago and when Andy Kohut began with Pew 20 years ago, it was pretty easy to get half of your calls completed. Half the homes that you called could, would respond to you in polls. The latest one that we did is 9%. And what the danger in polling on that, so the danger for social scientists in this is that the non-respondents begin to look different from the respondents and the things that you think you're saying about the re representative sample of the public no longer become true. And the great Harvard uh, so, uh, political scientist, Sidney Verba, said that the laws of that can't be calculated because the wonderful thing that pollsters do is bring everybody's voice to the table. Advocates have their say, people with the tools have their say, people who have loud voices have their say, but polls capture people who don't act that way. So we, we've seen some evidence in our polls. Luckily, um, at least for politics purposes, the, there is not a difference between non-respondents and respondents. Actually, the polling fraternity as a whole, including Pew, um, has a better track record in the last two presidential elections than it did in the previous five. So we're in trouble now, and we've, we're, we're trying to make adjustments to that. And it's, it, you know, the long-term future of polling is, is as likely as disrupted as any other industry around. Hi, I kept thinking about my LinkedIn, and um, this past year I discovered the, um, the, you know, who's viewing your profile, which has made my life both most, more interesting, useful, and not so great, because some people show up and show themselves brave enough to say, hey, I'm looking at your profile, and others want to be anonymous. And it causes this interesting psychological process for me, and, um, you know, I feel frustrated, I feel a little pissed off. Um, I don't like how it affects my own sense of self. I hate that, actually, and I'm working very hard at how to detach from somebody's you know, behavior in that perspective. And I, in that sense, I feel hopeless, helpless.
because I can't, and even I was talking to somebody about it the other day and they have premium LinkedIn. They can't even check who's viewing them. So it's, it's, it's really odd. Um, do you have any thoughts about all of that? Yeah, it, and it's, it's very odd for people, the sort of standard um, response that you get in lots of polls over lots of phenomenon is, and privacy is true of this too, I'm okay, everybody else is not. So if I lurk on somebody else's LinkedIn profile, way cool, not abusing it, I'm not a threat to her or anything like that. If somebody does it to me, it's, it, it really bugs me. And it's a, the, the grand paradox of network life is that so much more activity, because we're living in networks and because we have to work harder in networks to get our needs met, our reputations built and stuff like that, there's all sorts of encouragements to disclose things, right? Um, but at the same time, the, those imperatives conflict with sort of I don't I want to adjust the dial the way I want to dial it. So it's a it's a modern tension, and more and more people as the knowledge economy grows, more and more people have to live in that life. I mean, reputational stuff, the, your status. Sometimes I I wouldn't be surprised if in the next 20 years, uh, online kinds of activities become part of tenure reviews and things like that. So they're about depending on how you measure it, about a seventh or sixth of workers now are deeply into this reputational world where they have to be online and be disclosed, and so the tension's gonna grow. Okay. If, there are no, if there are no more questions, we'll take a break now, and we're gonna start promptly at 3.30. Uh,